So we'll start on the hour, but um, if you can come back to your desk about five minutes before. Or sure. Seven minutes before then, yeah. All right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So just one more, right? And then we're set. That's right. And I'm in touch with, uh, I'm in touch and she should be in soon. She's based in Nairobi, correct? Yeah. Mm. yeah and she is yeah. there mm. now. Okay. Uh, as you know, In Inger was uh, going to join us, and she's had to uh, she's had a medical um, issue that she's had to deal with, so she had to excuse herself. But uh, she was initially on the panel, and then yes. um, mm -hmm. she has been uh, she's been replaced. Okay. Are you are you opening doing any opening remarks or is it going directly to Anya? Um, I think it, it can just go directly to Anya. I uh, will just I'll just say go and you can go or Lewis will just say go and then you okay. can go. She should go right in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hello, this is Luis. Yes, thank you. Everything seems prepared for the broadcast. Simply, we will go live like five minutes before starting time, like in six minutes, seven minutes from now. Thank you. We we'll just also need to assign the captioner who will arrive very soon. And when we go live, we need to be silent, right? For five minutes, everybody will hear us. Sure. Interpretation is already prepared as well. In that case, can I just make clear to everyone um, that I'm going to ask uh, the panel to introduce themselves? I think it's very important that um, people see you and hear you and associate your image, your voice, everything. And if I introduce you, you'll just see me, and people will have won't have that correlation. Um, I know that that's all been sent an email to you but just to remind you and i'll make sure that i stop my video and mute myself when you're doing your bit and mm. once one of you finishes i'll then come back on introduce us because they and now so and so um and just do it in the order that we have on the list that was emailed today i was trying desperately to look for it but it's there mm -hmm. um so yes um and if you have any questions of me please do ask them before we go live mm. Do you want me to forward you the email, or is that okay? I have it. I have it. No, I, I have, have it. it. Yeah, I, I have, have it. it. Okay. I've got it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> belts and braces is everywhere, but I've felt some belts and braces, everything. So I have far too many bits of paper. Okay. Far too many <laughs> options to open on my laptop as well, and my mobile, and my other mobile. Some of our technical support people are actually based in Nairobi, so we can get one of them to go across. It's a great world, isn't it? That we're all digitally connected and our, and our digital backends can be all over the world now. Yes, exactly, yeah. Mm. How fast did that happen, huh? Incredible. I know, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm.
I understand that uh, Joyce is also now in. Joyce, can you turn your camera on and uh, do a sound check, please? Hi, Joyce. Oh, okay, I think we can maybe see you in a second. Your name just popped up. There we go, great. Check it out, can you do a sound test can with you, Joyce? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, yes, great. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm gonna mute. David, is that okay? I'm here. <laughs> Wonderful, yes, please. We'll, we'll, mm -hmm. We're gonna go live in uh, one minute or two minutes and we'll, okay. have a silent, we'll have a silent pause just beforehand. Fine. Mm -hmm. Uh, since everybody's here, I'm going to turn off my mic and camera and Lewis will tell you when to start and, but I'll still be here in the background and I'm also on the WhatsApp. So that's, yeah. Thank you, Chengadai, and thank you again for, uh, making this happen, uh, as part of the IGF and, uh, it's really, it's, it's really a fantastic honor to, to be the final high level panel in the IGF 2020. So thank you again. Yes, thank you, Chengetai. Um, I mean, we can go live in maybe two minutes, something like that, but uh, let's start at the hour. Uh, we're still waiting for, for the captioner to arrive. I just warned them, but they should be here soon. So Great. you can be in standby. I think that's fine. Thank you very much. I will also fade into the background, into the, into the chat, and into the world of WhatsApp. Um, so I will uh, wish you a fantastic panel. And I thank everybody again from the bottom of my heart for contributing and for engaging in this really important topic. So thank you again.
Colleagues, I would suggest everybody turn their camera on, please. Good afternoon and welcome to this session focusing on the future governance of the environmental data in the age of uncertainty. My name is Anja Lichtarovic and I'm a senior broadcast journalist at the BBC. I'm currently the producer of Digital Planet, the BBC World Service weekly radio program that looks at how technology affects our everyday lives and in turn how our everyday lives affect technology. We have continued to broadcast every week during the UK lockdowns, and we're very fortunate that we had already embraced many tech innovations in radio ahead of the rest of the BBC and did not experience too much upheaval when we suddenly could not come into the studios as often as before. I want to open this panel and acknowledge the hundreds of stakeholders across the IGF that worked so hard to put environment and digital cooperation on the agenda of the IGF. This has been a precedent setting IGF with 12 different workshops on the environment together with a main session and this high level panel. I'm sure the panelists will join me in a short applause. Don't worry about unmuting, I know that you're all clapping to the IGF community for having the vision and leadership to make environment one of the key topics in particular. I wanted to highlight the ideas and energy that the IGF youth ambassadors have put into this topic as well. Obviously, you are the next generation of internet leaders and it's great to see that you are already thinking about using digital tools to drive forward environmental sustainability on what has now become a digital planet. Now, I'm very excited to be moderating this panel. It's my first all woman panel, and I'm not sure how to refer to it, to be honest with you. There is an equivalent for the all male panel, the manel, uh, as I'm sure you all know. So if anybody has any ideas or knows what the term is, do please let me know uh, what I should call this special event. But before I ask the panel to introduce themselves, I wanted to briefly summarize what environmental data actually is so we can focus clearly on that during our discussion. Environmental data is based on the measurement of environmental pressures, the state of the environment and the impacts on ecosystems. Our behavior on our planet is currently not sustainable. Most of us know this, yet many of us continue to act in the same way. One way of trying to force our actions to change is to provide evidence of what is currently happening and modeling what may happen in the future to the environment. The idea of creating a digital ecosystem could help decision makers and individuals act in a way that will make our future on earth sustainable. To create this digital ecosystem, we will need reliable, accurate, clean data about the environment from a vastly diverse group of sources individuals, governments, private companies, NGOs, to name but a few. And in turn, this data then needs to be managed, manipulated and governed to help us build resilience and ultimately positively impact our world. The key now is to manage this wealth of information. Five billion mobile phones, which could all collect geocoded environmental data, close to 2000 satellites and orbits able to add to the digital ecosystem model. 
citizen science via app data collection, more than 2 million scientific papers published in 2016, unknown numbers of surveys and reports by private companies. The scale of the environmental data available is possibly too big to comprehend, at least by me. Without managing this data and being able to understand it, then the sustainable development goals will not be met. I think a constant thought throughout this session should be the UN Environment Programme statement that the lack of access to data is a fundamental driver of inequality, exclusion and marginalisation. We need environmental data to not only manage the environment, but to push for equality and fairness. I will now hand over to the panel to introduce themselves. Firstly, Joyce Masuya, Deputy Director of the UN Environment Programme. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, my name is uh, Joyce Msuya, uh, Deputy Executive Director, United Nations Environment Programme at Assistant Secretary General level. Over to you. Thank you, Joyce. And now to Joyce Murray, Digital Minister for Canada. Good uh, morning, good afternoon, uh, where you may be in different time zones. I'm Joyce Murray. I am the Minister of Digital Government uh, for the Government of Canada and also a former Environment Minister for the province of British Columbia and before that uh, a businesswoman in the business of uh, planting trees and restoring ecosystems. So I'll be bringing those three perspectives to the panel today. Thank you, Joyce. Now, Selena Lee, co-founder and CEO at Zindi. Hi, thank you so much, Anya, and it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Selena Lee, and I'm the CEO of Zindi. We are a African startup. I'm based in South Africa. Um, we are a data science competition platform focused on the African market. We've convened a community of over 20,000 data scientists on our platform that are solving some of the world's most pressing problems using AI and machine learning. Thank you. Thank you, Selena. And now moving to Dr. Kelsey Leonard, Advisory Council Member, U.S. Indigenous Data Sovereignty Network and Faculty of Environment, University of Waterloo. So hello everyone and uh, welcome. Thank you for having me and for hosting this panel. I am from the Shinnecock Nation and we are an Indigenous nation located on the southern shores of Pominock, what you may currently know today as Long Island, New York. And I'm happy to be joining you from Anishinaabek um, and Haudenosaunee Territory in Ontario, Canada. Thank you, Kelsey. Now, Dr. Amy Lurz, Global Lead, Microsoft Sustainability Fund. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much for, for including me in this panel. My name is Amy Lurz. I'm the Global Lead for Sustainability Science at Microsoft, where we're really working to bring science, data, and technology together to advance global sustainability. Thank you, Amy. And finally, Rose Mumbaza, Director of Climate Technology Center and Network. Um, thank you very much and good evening from the UN city in Copenhagen, Denmark. I'm the Director of the Climate Technology Center and Network. It's part of the operational mechanism of the technology mechanism of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, and it's hosted by the UN Environment Programme. Thank you. Thank you all. And now I will ask each one of you to name the single most important issue or question concerning environmental governance, again in the same order. So starting with you, Joyce Musuya. Thank you. Uh, before I answer the question, Anna, I just want to say how impressive and inspiring it has been to witness the emergence of environment as a core theme in this IGF. I do want to acknowledge and also thank all the hundreds of stakeholders that pushed for this and made this possible. Uh, what is one key issue uh, from our perspective is data fragmentation. Let me just cite some numbers. There are approximately 700 different environmental data platforms in operation by a combination of public and private sector actors. 
with a new platform launched every week. Uh, more than 7,000 organizations provide Earth observation data, and there are more than 450 million resources discoverable and accessible. So we need a basic set of principles, standards, and safeguards for these platforms. This is something here we at UNEP are working very, very uh, uh, hard on, and we have been asked by our member states, governments, to develop a global environmental data strategy. Uh, we also need an international repository to aggregate and validate the best available environmental data that can be used to monitor global progress, for example, the SDGs and multilateral environmental agreements. We are building such a platform to achieve this, which is called the World Environment Situation Room. So let me stop here, but that's one data fragmentation is a key issue. Over to you. Thank you very much. Now moving to Joyce Murray. Data, data ownership. I almost hate to use that term because I think what we are looking for is data stewardship. <clears throat> but I think it's very important to identify um, what are the rules around the data and who is, uh, who is overseeing those rules uh, because it will be generated, collected and used by both public and private organizations. And so there are various interests in, in using the data. So the idea that we are uh, collectively stewards of data for the common good, I think is very important. And then accompanying that is the principle around compliance and enforcement. I mean, you can have all the rules that uh, make sense, but if there are not clear mechanisms for uh, compliance and enforcement, uh, then there will be those who are going to um, exploit the situation and uh, utilize that data for ends for which it was not intended. So um, I think um, there's there are underlying those principles are then a, a number of others. And one I would say is, uh, is continuous improvement. We have to recognize how quickly things are moving in, this, in the digital universe. And so we have to make sure that any structures are designed from the outset that they can be um, updated and, uh, and respond to the situation. So continuous improvement and, uh, and, and digital principles built in by design. So that's uh, things like, uh, like user uh, experience being very much at the heart of how this is structured because we can do everything that uh, makes sense from a, a, techni a technical perspective, a design perspective. But if those who are using the data are not finding it easy and effective uh, to use it, then it will not have its intended benefit uh, for in terms of managing and improving uh, the human impact on our ecosystems. Thank you, Joyce. And now if we could move to Selena, please. So I have three interconnected governance issues that I wanted to highlight and then one that's very specific to our experience. Um, I think that immediately the issues that came to mind for me about government, data governance um, was transparency. As a data science competition platform, we come across all types of data and especially granular detailed data is the, are the types of data sets that we're working with. And we've seen many instances where data sets are out and available, but if they aren't accompanied by proper documentation and transparency about where the data came from, what do they actually represent? How was the data actually collected? And therefore, what are the limitations of the conclusions that you can derive from these data sets? Um, that is, you know, so this is, this transparency for me is one of the fundamental issues. Um, Second is a clear data standard. So this is very much related to the transparency, but it means that if we adopt 
certain data sets and accept certain data sets. They have to come along with a standard set of um, you know, quality standards, uh, interoperability of the data sets so that people as well will know how to use them uh, safely and responsibly. And finally, on the point of responsibility, of course, data, safeguarding uh, data privacy and ensuring that the individuals who are, I guess, the source of the data are properly uh, and appropriately uh, recognized, properly and appropriately um, benefited by the outputs of the products of the data. Um, so I think that those three kind of go together, transparency, data standards, and safeguarding. And then the final one that I just wanted to mention from a data science perspective um, and the work that we do is finding the right balance between a robust default privacy standard, um, which you know a lot of times implies a lot of aggregating data and balancing that with the creativity, creativity that can be unlocked by the solutions that and the and by the data scientists that are able to unlock new products, new concepts, new insights from granular data. So finding the right balance between the granular data and the aggregated data that that um, protects privacy. Thank you, Selena. And now we move to Kelsey. Thank you so much. I really would uh, second so much of what my other panelists have said in terms of um, data safeguarding and, and protections. One of the things that I notice in my own science and, and research related to, to environmental data governance, particularly in the Great Lakes and, and related to the oceans, is the absence of, of Indigenous peoples. Our governments are often excluded from uh, the data governance infrastructure. And, and I think that that's something that we really have to remedy to ensure that we're not promulgating more instances of colonialism in digital spaces. So what some scholars have called digital colonialism. And I'm really seeing that right now in the environmental data space and in the way in which environmental data is governed. And so there are some amazing uh, alliances like the Global Indigenous Data Alliance which has put forward principles of indigenous data sovereignty, which I think is the path forward for how we need to be thinking about environmental data governance. Because right now what we're seeing is that environmental data is being mined and extracted from indigenous territories. Uh, indigenous peoples and our lands are said through global studies that 80% of the world's biodiversity. So scientists are really uh, eager and keen to learn from our lands and territories about that richness and about the way in which we have stewarded the lands for thousands of years, and yet we are not then a part of the ownership and control of the data that's extracted from our territories and communities. And then even further, how that data is, is used and manipulated to inform decision making going forward. And so I think that that's a, a real challenge for us moving forward is how do we ensure indigenous rights are protected in the environmental data governance space? And I think firstly, that means that indigenous peoples have ownership and control over our data and the way in which it's used. And that there are prescriptions and principles outlined in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples that should also inform our data ecosystems and the way in which we govern environmental data. So thank you. Kelsey, that was great. Thank you so much. Now moving to Amy, please. Thank you. Um, it's wonderful to, to hear all these different perspectives, which I think are really um, honing in on some similar themes, but but from from different and, and importantly uh, nuanced angles. To me, the overarching governance challenge related to the digital world and environmental sustainability is embedded in the fact that today humanity is interconnected to and interdependent on each other through both the digital and the natural worlds. And as a result, we, we fundamentally need to sort of ex a grasp, recognize that to achieve a trusted, inclusive and secure internet is intertwined with achieving a climate safe and sustainable world. And so from this perspective, my the sort of a key governance issue for environmental sustainability is building a trusted, inclusive, and secure internet. So in trust, of course, there, these are uh, rich, rich words which have many dimensions, but just to highlight a few of them, 
Trust is being challenged today, of course, in the context of environmental issues around misinformation. And having trust in the information about what it, about the trends um, and uh, analysis of environmental systems is critical. And as was mentioned earlier, there are a number of open of data platforms um, that are gathering these data together and making being able to have a trusted source of what those what of of the data that is available um, is critical. The second point is inclusivity. And inclusivity is critical, not just in terms of what data is available and to whom, but also who has access to the tools, the capacity to turn that data into insight and knowledge. And finally, security. Of course, we need to be, have, make sure that the data is secure, but again, not just data security, but to security that everybody from different regions of the world feels safe and empowered to participate in the digital data um, uh, digital data for sustainability activities. These three pieces together, um, both from a data and from an include from from the community that's using those data, I see is is critical for achieving the sustainability goals. Thank you, Amy. And now, finally, moving to Rose, please. Um, thank you very much. I, I think I want to focus on something that is related to the mandate of the Climate Technology Center and network, which is the facilitation of environmentally sound technology. So primarily, um, one of the key issues then that we find to be of critical importance in, in, in relation to this is the environmental soundness of how this environmental data itself is generated and it's stored and managed uh, because we all must agree that in fact um, the technologies that will enable us to access and to store this data and use it for various reasons including um, environmental decision making are not necessarily sustainable and I'll give you just an example if you look at the amount of electronic waste uh, that would come out of some of the tools that are used for data storage or access phones um, laptops, computers, we are told now that we put around 44.7 million tons of electronic waste out. This is um, expected to grow because with greater efficiency in production systems that makes these electronic devices, including storage devices and infrastructure cheap, it means even more numbers of people have access to these resources. Uh, and so this is what we traditionally call the rebound effect, it's almost an unintended consequence of the development um, that we attain as humans. And so within the mandate of the Climate Technology Center, which is to um, enable um, environmentally sound technological transfer among nations, primarily between developed and developing nations, this is of paramount importance. But also because our mandate is to support developing countries, it is very clear in the countries I work in, at least we have projects in around 100 countries, that actually there's a huge global digital divide across regions in the world, but also within the countries in the regions. I'll give you an example. I come from Africa, so it's probably easier for me to do that. The IFC has just told us recently only 40% 40 40 of all the people on that continent have access to digital technologies. The number of women is even less. So to go to the question one of the panelists made, uh, data for who? If we are going to support environmental decision making at all levels from the policy to the community level, uh, who are the sources of this data? who has access to this data to make the decisions they need to make, that becomes absolutely um, important. So um, I think those are the two interconnected issues that I want to talk about, the environmental sustainability of this environment data and the manner in which it's collected and stored and used, uh, but also the digital divide that means that actually contrary to what we think, not everybody might actually be able to access that data or even to participate in its generation and therefore the issue of whose data, who does it represent and what decisions can we make with it. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. Would anybody like to reflect on any of the points that the panellists made? Well, 
please unmute yourself and talk yeah. if you would like to add anything. Well, I just, I, I've been so impressed by all of the ideas that have come up so far. And I would say that inclusion and justice and uh, it, it, indigenous uh, indigenous uh, perspectives uh, is super important, uh, as is diversity, women, and that we're thinking inclusively as to who's, uh, who's going to be using and benefiting from this data. I wanted to just mention on the Environmental Sustainability Initiative, there's a group of nations that is called the Digital Nations. It's 10 countries that are work together on advancing our digital transformation. And the Canada just, just put forward an initiative around environmental sustainability for the Digital Nations uh, to be working on so that um, the opportunities for thinking about uh, the equipment and the processes and our operations and the waste management, uh, green procurement uh, and, and so on are, I think have to be woven into everything we do. And so I was very had, glad to hear you talk, Rose, about environmental sustainability. Uh, Canada is gonna be um, a, pushing, not pushing, but leading the charge on that as part of the dish, digital nations agenda over the coming year. And, uh, and uh, so thanks for raising it. Please, Amy. So um, I, I wanted to just touch on that last point too about the environmental sustainability of the data, of the data generation and analysis and, and capture that was uh, raised, because I think that is a really critical issue. And, and at Microsoft, we're taking that very seriously. Um, we've committed to, um, we're already carbon neutral and we're committed to becoming net negative um, by the end of the decade, uh, as well as uh, zero waste, um, uh, net positive on water and land. And so integrating the use, at how we integrate science and data for solving problems, as well as making sure that we clean up our own uh, corporate uh, footprint um, and help others that we work with do that is a key part of, of, of our efforts. And I think we need, we, we need to think of those as a continuum, not as separate issues, but really as an integrated piece. Thank you. Now, moving on, what are the two one or two key principles or safeguards that you would like to propose as part of a global governance framework for environmental data? Again, if we can start with Joyce Masuya, please. Thank you. Um, I think first, uh, it's important to recognize that uh, environment, uh, environmental data exist in a digital ecosystem and that we need to structure data and analytics to achieve specific outcomes and support uh, specific decisions. A number of panelists in the previous uh, session actually uh, talked about it. So thinking about environmental data for a purpose, and in our case within the United Nations, for example, uh, we would encourage, for example, looking at the structure of a digital ecosystem of environmental data to be able to monitor global commitments, for example, the SDGs, but also the multilateral environmental targets. Uh, but equally, if not more important, use the data to inform and shape uh, policy options, uh, to inform markets, supply chains, and consumer behaviors. If you look at things like sustainable production and consumption, Unless we have the data, the consumer's behavior would not actually shift. Second is standards. International standards are needed to ensure that environmental data can be aggregated at the global level and can be interoperable inter with other environmental data, such as the socioeconomic data through the use of uh, standardized application programming interfaces. So we need an API for F uh, framework. Lastly, um, environmental data sets should be as open as possible. Looking at data as global public good, I think uh, Minister Joyce from Canada alluded to this, and as uh, agile as possible because context for the data matters. So depending on specific use cases and potential risks, 
the environmental data governance should adopt an agile approach that favors experimentation, iteration, differentiation, and adaptation as needed. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. And can I just ask our audience if they have any questions, then please do write them in the chat on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, hopefully we'll have time to take a few questions later. Now, if I could ask Joyce Murray to add to the safeguarding debate. Well, that's a pretty critical <clears throat> element to be uh, thinking in advance. And I, I think there's not, I mean, right from the beginning, uh, those kinds of uh, principles need to be factored into the design. I, seems very complicated to me uh, after just coming out of a, a briefing on uh, the government of Canada's plans to uh, improve our identity management and multi-factor uh, authentication so we can uh, have a single sign in for various government of Canada programs. And I see the complexities of that just in one country. Um, but I think it's very critical that the, the kind of access uh, the authentication, multi-factor authentication for people uh, utilizing this data, having access to it, because there may be personal data, there certainly is commercially valuable data, and there also will be data that, um, as was mentioned, uh, as I think it was um, Selena talking about, Sorry, it was Kelsey talking about uh, Indigenous uh, owned data. So as, as we have uh, the theme of data stewardship, we also need to understand the Indigenous uh, perspective and ownership of, of, their, of their data. So, so th that's just, a, that's, I mean, that's a lot of uh, stream of consciousness there. Uh, I understand that there is um, international human rights law and UN guiding principles on business and human rights that talk about um, the use of, <clears throat> for, for example, artificial intelligence. So we need to, let's, let's not reinvent the wheel. Uh, let's find best practices in terms of uh, the use of machine learning and the use of data uh, um, access and authentication and make sure those things are built in uh, from, from the very beginning of this project because it will be much harder to change it later on and, and adjust for that. Um, and I think the other thing that uh, we have to think about is, is there anything that could create national or regional security risks and how is that data treated separately um, or not? How, how is that addressed? Uh, we're going to need a range of formal and informal agreements um, that, should be, that should lay out in a very transparent way uh, how this is being set up and how it's being governed and how it's being, um, it's being complied with. <clears throat> So openness and transparency, I know, has already been mentioned by other panelists, but that is a core principle. So at the same time as we have to think about confidentiality and, and authentication, we also need that realm of openness and transparency to be a, a founding principle of what we're doing here. So a few thoughts. Thank you, Joyce. And now moving to Selena, please. Thank you. Um, I agree with what all of the other panelists are saying. So I just want to add a bit from um, our perspective at Zindi, working with data scientists and working with um, companies and governments that have very specific problems that they're solving. Uh, I, one of the things I wanted to highlight is that in order for data to live up to its promise, and we can talk about data in very high level terms and vague terms, but in order for data to be translated into the impact that we want to see, we have to ensure that we are also understanding the entire value chain and the market that, that drives data and drives data from turning into just data into actual insights or actual products. Um, and so at Zindi, we ran a competition recently where we used Sentinel 5P data 
um, to extrapolate air quality across Africa, a place where a continent where if you look at the data that's available on air quality, it is extremely sparse. I think we found a couple of sensor data sets from South Africa and maybe Kenya. Um, but the rest of the world was completely covered with air sensors and constant real time data that was constantly being uploaded onto the internet and freely available to everybody. So one of the questions we asked was, well, how can we fill in this data gap? So we use Sentinel 5P data to, to develop machine learning models to fill this data gap. We, our data scientists from across Africa built the machine learning models and now it's being hosted on SEAN, which is the South, Af South African Earth Observation Network. So to understand that data is everything from the raw data, how it's collected, who gets access to the data so that they can analyze it and turn it into actual insights, and then who ends up hosting the data products at the end are all questions that we have to address and acknowledge as important. And what I want to point out here, uh, underlining what everyone is saying about inclusivity and representation, this is where representation matters. That we understand the entire value chain and representation has to insert itself in every single step of the way as we, as we look at the data value chain. So um, yeah, that, uh, so I wanted to highlight, yes, representation and accessibility of, of these data products and the raw data itself. Thank you, Selena. Now, Kelsey, please. Wonderful. Thank you. And thank you again to the panelists for uh, this robust conversation. I would say that in terms of safeguards and principles, we need environmental data for justice and equitable outcomes. And what does that mean in the space that I work in, particularly for Indigenous peoples, is we need disaggregated data that actually measures environmental indicators for Indigenous peoples and communities and our nations. Right now, you can go to any of the major uh, environmental data sets and we're absent, right? We can, we can have disaggregated data based on uh, sometimes potentially race and ethnicity, and, but mostly it's sort of national level or subnational level data. And we are just sort of marginalized from the collection. So if we're not counted, how can we matter in decision making? And also how can, you know, when we think about data accessibility, how can our governments and our leaders use data accessibly to be informed decision makers if the data that's presented to them doesn't even measure our people, our populations, or our territories. So that's you know a real big issue that we have to um, come to terms with and think through some sustainable solutions for the environmental data ecosystem. In particular, because our communities, indigenous communities, are on the front lines of the climate crisis. And we think about what is the value and importance of environmental data right now in our human history, it's to hopefully tackle this you know, emerging crisis that our world is facing. And for indigenous people being on the front lines, we need access to data that is meaningful and that counts our people. So that's, that's a really big safeguard and, and principle that I hope we could build in to a future data, data ecosystem. And in addition, one of the things I wanted to bring up before I sort of outline a path forward that other indigenous scholars have, have uh, created uh, through Indigenous data sovereignty principles is the way in which English, the English language is monopolizing our data infrastructure and data ecosystem right now, um, and how that disenfranchises Indigenous languages. We right now are seeing Indigenous languages around the world. The 2019 was the UN uh, year for Indigenous languages. We are seeing the loss of those languages. Those languages go dormant because they are being forced out of operation, out of use, out of consideration and care. And so I really think that when we think through data governance and environmental data governance, because so much of our environmental knowledge is captured in our indigenous knowledge systems and languages, we need to create data ecosystems that uplift those languages in, in their structure and, and in their creation and design from the outset, as others have said earlier. So, the Global Indigenous Data Alliance has put together what we call the CARE principles for enacting Indigenous data sovereignty for the governance of Indigenous data. And those CARE principles stand for collective benefit, that data ecosystems should be designed and function in a way that support Indigenous peoples and rights, that we have the authority to control the, those data sets that are coming from our communities, 
and that there's also responsibility of other data scientists, those working with data that is about Indigenous peoples and coming from our territory to share how that data is being used to support Indigenous self-determination. And lastly, ethics. You know, we have to be good human beings on this planet, and a part of that is also in the way in which we use and design data systems. Um, and hopefully that they will respect Indigenous rights and upholding those Indigenous ethics. So, thank you. Thank you, Kelsey. And just before I move on, questions can be posted either in the chat or on the Q&A function, and you'll find that under the more button at the bottom of the screen. Now, uh, if I can ask Amy her thoughts on safeguarding, please. Great. So, um, you know, I think some of the principles that uh, the number of principles to think about, I guess one of the ones I wanted to highlight is the need to really recognize, um, uh, I need to focus in on essential sustainability uh, data that needs to be available. And, and I say that because we're in this, you know, uh, information age where we're flooded by data and that's been highlighted for sure. But there are critical information that we don't have, but that we could have if we focused on. Um, and for example, in terms of our biodiversity, there, there's a lot of information that isn't available, but, but if we focus in on it, um, we, we could get that and, and make decisions in a much wiser way before we lose critical bio, biodiversity that's supporting our life support systems. And so recognizing that we need to agree, what are those essential uh, data for managing Earth systems? And, and this is one of the things that, that we're doing here at Microsoft in the context of building a planetary computer, trying to identify those core data sets so that we can make them available to everybody who is working on conservation issues around the world. And one of the key principles for doing that to deciding what are the key, what are those key variables is really taking a multi-stakeholder approach. Um, and this is where these kinds of forums are so, so valuable to, to bring together government, private sector, civil society um, to, to uh, identify what those are both regionally and, um, and sectorally. And finally, a, a, a piece of that um, is the essential variables uh, aren't, these essential data sets aren't, of course, valuable unless they are accessible and open to the diversity of, of um, actors engaged in what is increasingly a multi-stakeholder, multi-sectoral um, uh, uh, participation in environmental governance. And so um, honing in on together, deciding what are those key variables, making sure that we actively go out and um, assure that we have validated uh, access to those data so we can make decisions, I think is, is a, a core principle that we need to move forward with. And um, uh, if we're gonna be able to know that we're managing this correctly and, and um, uh, make decisions wisely. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. And now finally to Rose. Um, thank you. I think the panelists have raised really important information and just uh, the last speaker really highlighting the importance of, um, you know, what is the essential data we have? From my point of view, climate data is very important to create resilience, especially in the small island developing states and the more vulnerable communities, as well as other categories of data. So I, I think it is really important at this point in time where there's a whole range of data that is available that for the environment data that we focus on, that it is the kind of data that supports the decision making that is good for nature and for people ultimately. So that's the way I would put it. And so the whole issue of leaving uh, no one behind. Um, so again, if it's data that we need to create resilience, um, create better livelihoods or um, protect people through information on air quality, that's data that is important. It's good for nature and it's good for people. So leaving no one behind and creating the data that we need. 
and then lastly, the one that I think uh, as a community, uh, a safeguard that we could work with is the uh, large body of work we already have on environmental safeguards, reviewing it and making sure it is aligned to this new huge digital agenda to make sure that it is environmentally sustainable and that we do not have to deal um, with the unintended consequences of what it is that we are trying to do. So I think the environmental safeguard system really is at a point where it has to be reviewed to extend beyond the non-traditional areas where we've been looking at uh, uh, an important issue of environmental sustainability. Um, so really those are the two key issues that I, I would like to highlight at this point in terms of safeguards. Thank you, Rose. Now, moving to the questions from our audience, we have one from Monica Emmett. She asks, there were several mentions of the need for standards for environmental data. Who shall develop these standards? The floor is open. Uh, Would anyone like to comment on that? Um, well, I don't have a specific answer to that question, but I what I was wanting to to just bring into the conversation to add to the idea of essential and critical data for the solutions, add to the whole data chain idea, which I think is so important, and the disaggregate, disaggregated data for, for social justice purposes. What is the role of governments? I mean, I think it was, um, maybe it was, uh, I'm not sure who mentioned that this is government, civil society, uh, indigenous peoples, it's business, uh, it's, it's stakeholders, but government can play a very productive role if, we, if we're thinking about governments right from the beginning, because we, that, that there is a tremendous capacity there to facilitate or to undermine, I suppose. Um, if, if it's not thought through in the beginning. So what occurs to me is that there are organizations that bring governments together, not that we want to have something big and cumbersome and hard to get agreements, but something like the Open Government Partnership is a group of 78 countries. It's been meeting for 11 years, represents over 2 billion people, and it's all about the partnership between civil society and government in having um, really uh, an open uh, approach and principles to, to the use of data, but also to the engagement of people with their governments. So let's find some ways in which government can be built in uh, without it slowing down or, or, or you know, creating a lot of um, a bureaucracy, I suppose. Uh, but bringing them on board to this uh, initiative early on. Thank you, Joyce. Amy, I believe you want to add to this conversation too. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I think I, I wanted to stress again, um, as, uh, as was said earlier, that you know, I, the answer I think to who sets the standards does really have to be a multi-stakeholder approach. I think there is a critical role for government for sure, which it has a different character than, than the other players. And thinking that through is, is certainly critical. But what I wanted to really highlight is that I think that there are also standards in two different pieces. One is you know, what data is available, you know, what, what are the essential variables and how do we decide that? And that I think has to be multi-stakeholder. Um, how, you know, how it's safeguarded and, and open and so forth and interoperable. But I think there's another component that's really critical as well, especially when we're talking about environmental data. And that is the sort of validation or the verification. Um, you know, what is the essential, what is the data in which we make our decisions um, in terms of global environmental issues. We have a process for this in terms of scientific information. We have a peer review process to say, these are the, you know, looking at the insights that are drawn from data. And I don't think we've really tackled that in, in a way that is gonna suffice to really make, uh, to really draw from the data that what we can 
if we don't tackle this issue of what is what is the trusted data in terms of the um, science? And there is an, an emergence of, you know, data science approaches to analyzing uh, large data and looking at trends and looking at changes and making predictions, which is a huge asset in terms of how we manage in near real time these challenges coming in front of us. But how do we connect that with a scientific community that understands natural and social systems from a process point of view. I think that is a challenge in front of us that is also a huge opportunity, but is one that we haven't grappled with. Thank you, Amy. Would anyone else like to answer Monica's question? No, well then moving on, can I now ask the panel for one voluntary commitment that you will undertake in 2021 to take forward the themes discussed in the panel today, starting again with Joyce Messiah, please. Thank you, and so I'm going to give you one external and one internal uh, for UNEP. I think external, because we have to also to be relevant and nimble, we commit to engage and potentially co-lead with the IGF process a best practice forum on the environment, not just IGF, but any other stakeholders that may be uh, interested. Internally, we are committing to contributing to our Secretary General's roadmap for digital cooperation and co-lead an action plan on digitalizing environmental sustainability. And that entails working with other UN entities that work in the environment space. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. Now to Joyce Murray, please. Um, well, thanks. And I, I think my, my previous intervention may have when when uh, who should make uh, who should make the decisions. And I started talking about government. <laughs> uh, I think that that uh, clearly the multi stakeholder approach is uh, is is the the right one. So I just wanted to make sure that that didn't come across as I want government to take this over. Uh, so a commitment, well, one commitment that I have made recently is as the, as the outgoing uh, chair of Digital Nations was to put in front of the group and have it accepted that Digital Nations would have a, a set, an environmental sustainability theme. Um, and so we'll continue over the coming year to promote and seek allies for this initiative in the lead up to the UN uh, Climate Change Conference and see if there's interest from other countries. So that's a digital nations initiative. But there's also, I, I just talked about the open government partnership. And I think there's a real possibility that we could get commitment in the fifth national action plan on open government uh, that we are uh, working with civil society to produce that um, we could implement an open data and open science to specifically to help fight climate change as one part of our national action plan. And this would of course include annual public open data reporting on the environmental footprint of federal operations, which is being done through our uh, Center for Greening Government. Um, I can't commit to this national action plan element because we do it in partnership with uh, civil society. Uh, we're just, we're in those uh, discussions and, con and consultations uh, now, but that's certainly something that I am personally very interested in doing. And that would be uh, then part of the broader open government uh, partnership uh, discussions and commitments. And as I mentioned, that's quite a number of countries that could then start to be connected in uh, with the this initiative that you're that you're uh, uh, put on the table today. Thank you, Joyce. Now, Selena, please. Thank you. Um, from Zindi's perspective, we're really driven by this mission to make AI and data science more accessible for everyone, to serve everyone, regardless of race, gender, even geography. So <clears throat> our commitment is to continue to up create opportunities for young African and other emerging market um, 
young people to continue to upskill in the area of AI, machine learning, and data science. Um, and through our platform also help make some of these valuable data sets more accessible and more public um, for real impact on the ground. Thank you, Selena. And I'll invite Kelsey now for her contribution. Thank you. Um, I think from my commitment, it's actually a, a commitment that I would ask of my fellow panelists and everyone that's tuning in today for the forum is to familiarize yourself with the care principles that I mentioned from the Global Indigenous Data Alliance, as well as the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. If you have never read the declaration, I think it's, it's a really important and pivotal document for you to, to read and to use as a framing uh, guidance for developing standards that, that should be governing environmental data moving forward. And so it's my call to action to each of you to hopefully take these two uh, principal documents and see what you can do with them in your own individual data ecosystem. And hopefully that will move the needle forward for our collective justice. So thank you. Thank you, Kelsey. And now Amy, please. There we go. Can you hear me? <laughs> um, well, first, I want to say sort of a, a personal uh, commitment. And I think because coming from this panel, I think it's been a great discussion. And I and I and I will reflect on the various different angles that this this panel has brought. And I want to thank you for for sharing those. Um, but I from a Microsoft perspe perspective, you know, we can I think there are two commitments. One is really to continue to push forward to make to reduce the environmental impact and become a net positive for the environment in the context of our footprint and our role uh, in the global economy. And more broadly though, to work with partners to make sure that we can um, identify uh, in a multi-stakeholder perspective, the essential variables, make those available in what we're developing in terms of the planetary computer, but within the context of these sorts of discussions. And so in that context, we, we want to engage in the dialogues and best practices that the forum is developing um, and, and integrate those and empower others, everyone to do more on sustain with sustainability data to, to, to achieve our sustainability goals. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. And now finally to Rose, please. Um, thank you very much. The commitments I, I will make are definitely within our mandate, um, which is the pr promoting environmentally sound technology. So in this regard, really, uh, the commitment I can make is that in this context to focus on some of the two issues that would have the, the most uh, significant environmental impacts, which would be energy, the amount of energy that is required uh, to drive this environmental data agenda and the digitization. So um, to work with those technologies that would promote efficiencies uh, to reduce the emission of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, but also to work um, with the member states, um, you know, that give us this mandate on the management of electronic waste, which is now growing to, you know, exponentially in numbers and potentially becoming a real global challenge. Uh, and this would include, um, you know, as we promote this in the countries, uh, of creating a degree of awareness. So the dialogues and conversations we need to have in the different spaces where the different stakeholders engage and take these decisions um, so that we are taking them with a degree of um, ethical understanding of what their consequences countries so that we deal with some of the challenges, for example, Selena was talking about, where the actual data gaps that we need for sound environmental decision making. Uh, thank you very much. Rose, thank you for concluding that section. And we've had a fascinating and very thought provoking uh, exchange of ideas today. And I want to thank the panelists for all their concrete suggestions and for the work they are developing in their institutions on this topic. The IGF and the UN Environmental Programme have pushed this issue uh, to the top of the agenda. And now the UNEP is considering making digitalization of environmental sustainability a four year priority. The media too needs to report more on environmental data 
and the implication of using it sensibly, please do contact me at Digital Planet um, about this. As we have heard across the various environmental tracks in the IGF, as well as on the panel today, every scientific assessment is giving us 10 years left to solve climate change, biodiversity loss and pollution. Living as we have been living and doing business as usual is clearly not working. And we need to find ways to make exponential progress in these three areas. Digital transformation is going to play a massive role if it can be harnessed for environmental sustainability. The stakeholders need to establish together how environmental data and metrics can be hard coded into application, platforms, filters, and algorithms of the digital economy, economy to fundamentally change the incentive structures for sustainability if we are to see any benefit to our environment. Working together with environmental data and digital technologies could decarbonize, dematerialize, and detoxify global supply chains, as well as help us predict and respond to global environmental risks. Together, we can take collective action on environmental digital cooperation and commit to concrete action with the support of the IGF and UNEP. Thank you to everyone on the panel today and those behind the scenes, translators and scribes as well who have made all of this happen. I hope to come back next year to hear about the tangible progress that has been made. Thank you. Ah. What? Thank you very much to Anya and thank you very much to our panelists. Um, it was a great session. Uh, we will be having the closing session in this room, in the same room. So if you want to stay for the closing session, um, please stay. And those closing session panelists, uh, just stay in this room and we will upgrade you to panelists if you're in the um, audience. And so thank you again and we'll see you in 20 minutes. Thank you. And David, if you want to say something. Uh, no, I was going to say fantastic work, but everybody left. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> okay. You. Cheers.
Uh, good afternoon or good morning to you. Uh, can we just test our cameras and um, microphone? Oh, good morning. Good afternoon, Chengetai. How is life? Uh, I'm fine. And you, Christoph? Very good. Thank you. Good, good. Yes, I think everything is working fine with you. So that's great. Yes. Uh, there's a bit of a reflection on your lens, I think. Yes, I'm I not too sure. Try to correct it, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's getting better. Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. I will put additional light as well. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, is it better now? Uh, um, it's okay. better, but when you tilt it up, it comes worse. Okay. So are you yeah, ready? now it's better. Yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Carlos Molina, greetings. Um, can we just test your microphone? Good afternoon to you. Yes, yeah, it's working fine. We got from Costa Rica. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's a pleasure to meet you. I was in Costa Rica, I think, two years ago. Oh. Ah, how was the experience? Oh, great. A yeah, wonderful place, wonderful country. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, right, right now it's raining because the consequence of the Yoda hurricane. So. Oh, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. It's a terrible situation there the facing in Honduras and Salvador. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, all right, thank you. And um, sorry, let me go. Henriette, can we just test your um, video and microphone? Is that okay? Yes, perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. Joran, good morning. Good morning, uh, my friend. And how are you? Yes, we can hear you quite well. And yes, we see you as well. So that's great. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Um, let's see who else we have. And our moderator has just arrived, Jonathan. Um, I think he's still setting up. So. Hello, hello, how are you? I'm fine, Jonathan, and how are you doing? I'm all right on a grey day in London. So. Ah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, uh, just working mm -hmm. out, uh, hold on, I should be with you in a second, setting up the best, uh, best way to do this. Okay, yeah. no problem. We're just um, testing everybody's um, very good microphone. Hello, Masango. Yes, hello, Doctor Mohammed. How are you doing? Okay. Great. 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 Yes. Okay. We hear you, and we see you. Well. Oh. Mm. I did not hear what you were saying because I had to enter the page. But anyway, I'm on now, so I guess it doesn't really mean matter. No, uh, we were just testing everybody's uh, microphone and um, camera, and yours is working great, and we can hear you um, very well. So that's good. Uh, we're going to start at 20 past the hour. Um, and so at the moment we're just going through and testing everybody's um, setup just to make sure it works. Um, Deputy Minister Parshan, um, would you mind switching on your camera and just having a microphone? Oh. No, no, no. Uh, good afternoon, sir. I'm not uh, Mr. Parshan. We're testing uh, the system. Yes, that's fine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and what about translation? We do not see. Uh, bottom uh, on the screen uh, from uh, Russian Russian interpretation. There should be a button next to where it says closed captioning. There should be an interpretation button. And if you click that, you have the list of the uh, UN languages. Would you see it? We just, this is something we just found out that it seems to be different on certain computers. Um, but there should be an interpretation between closed caption and the leave button. Uh, would you see it? Um, there's share screen, closed caption, and then interpretation. Yeah. If you have an old version of Zoom, then you won't have that. 
You may have enough time to upgrade. I don't know if that helps, or maybe upgrade to a different uh, 